it's just picking now. It is, and this also means that I can go to previous matches for stats. Yes. In the first time these two teams played against each other, it was a 2-0 in favor of BTG. Surprise, surprise. The A-team tried to lean pretty heavily in the first game on a Blaze composition around a Hanzo Blaze Diablo burst with a little bit of Karazim. Yeah. Second comp, a little bit more sustainy. Greymane Lee, I say sustainy actually, never mind. Greymane Lee Ming and Malthael coming in. But they were outplayed by in the first game by basically the exact comp that they played in the second game. And in the first, in the second game, BTG beat them with a Diablo Phoenix comp. With right. Amadeev. That's pretty cool. So, welcome to round two of HEC China, ladies and gentlemen. We're officially at the halfway point. Uh, at the halftime show, if you will, to put it in BOE terms. And for those of you who are not familiar with the format, who don't really know what that is, what that means, from now on, every team is going to face each other for the second time. And you saw that in the map selection screen, which means no more map banning, because the maps that were picked in the first round are no longer eligible for the second round. So we basically have our four maps that are crossed out. And that means, of course, more map variety, um, crazier games potentially on maps like Brex's Holdout, Volskaya Foundry, uh, Towers of Doom, Curse Hollow. Those are going to be the maps that are going to be played much more from now on. Uh, so a unique thing about HTC China and a really nice twist to make these series a little more spicy. So we see Hanzo and Deckard Kane being picked up very quickly by the A-Team. They definitely do like their Hanzo. It's uh, had mixed success for them in the past though, but we'll see if they can pull it off this time. Let's see if they can make it work. Hanzo coming back into this. I think he was ignored in that last series altogether. So uh, let's see if he can make an impact again. Curse Hollow, of course, is a sensational map for Hanzo. First of all, there's a lot of walls that he can use his scatter shot from. Uh, and most importantly, he offers boss control. Not necessarily in terms of, you know, disengage like a mighty gust or aterial holy ground, but in terms of clearing speed. You go for the W build and the scatter arrows, you're going to get so much damage done in a very quick time. It is the Dahaka and the Diablo. Mm -hmm. Very much a solid front line with great engage potential and some fantastic flanking potential. The Dahaka, of course, we've already seen just how effective they can be, especially against Deckard Kane, who really wants to be right at the back line. Yeah. Already, this is a very, very scary front line for the Deckard Kane. I, I, I guess I can't even call it the Haka frontliner, he's like a like a side liner, back liner. I don't know. He comes in from all those weird angles and surprises enemies uh, with a sudden isolation and a licky sticky tongue. Um, let's see if he can do it again. So far, the Hakas have looked pretty darn good in HTC China. Um, let's see if they can make it happen again. And this Malthale ban is very interesting. I think that caters towards the Diablo and how they want to keep him safe. They're actually prioritizing the Malthale ban over the Urel ban. Which is still pretty... It makes sense in my opinion. I don't, hate it, but I don't hate it, I guess, but I guess Malthair would have been the best counter to... a better counter to the Haka than mm. the Urel is. Yeah, okay. If they hadn't picked the Haka themselves, I would have thought it was super weird, but they already have a solo laner, so I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Also, the anti-healing that uh, uh, Meltrian provides, you know, the touch of death, we've seen it repeatedly doing so much work against self-sustaining warriors and both Diablo and Dehaka are pretty self-sustaining and we see Terriel plus ETC being deployed to combat and we haven't seen a lot of Terriel, have we, Tetcher? I think we've seen a lot of ETC, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I saw a little bit of Terriel yesterday. It had mixed success, but the ETC is also still a little bit rarer. I'm curious as to whether this will be a mosh pit or a stage dive hmm. to match up with the global. Hmm. That is an interesting question indeed. I prefer ETC in the early game rotations. So I definitely think he shouldn't be the solo laner of the get-go. So they have a little bit more rotation power, you know, with the stun engages and the disengage on the face melt. So I think Tyrael should solo lane for the most part in the early stage. But I agree with you, once we enter level 10 and later, the stage dive might be indeed a very nice counter to the Dehaka global pressure. So now then. What are we going to have here to capitalize on that Dahaka Global Pressure and to put pressure onto the A-Team with follow-up to that Diablo? Phoenix is already on the board, so they already have the main combo. Now they add some more slows. Okay. The Jaina coming out and some Alex Straza zoning potential and a little bit of burst healing later on. Yeah. First Alex Straza of the day. Uh, China 
really loved the support. They played it repeatedly at the midseason brawl to the point where other teams were actually starting to mimic it a little bit. I think the involvement rate of Alex Strasse increased quite substantially after the midseason brawl and the Chinese teams playing it all over the place, uh, which is pretty pretty astounding, especially if you consider the pretty poor success rate of the Alex Strasse on the Chinese teams in those international tournaments, of course. Not talking about league play. What is Alex Strasse's win rate in the league play? Can you look that up, Tetcher? I can absolutely look that up. That would be amazing and also very interesting to know because I feel like it's actually more than 50%. That's going to be my uh, assumption here. I, I would say 53. 53% is the prediction from Mr. Kendrick. What do you Switch. say? So we're just looking. 53% uh, is the prediction from Mr. Kendrick Switch as I'm still looking up. As we see a Maev as the final pickup for the A team. That's mm -hmm. a hell of a wombo they have. That it could be. So we just want we just want this season of HTC China. This season, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, phase two or phase one? Uh, both. Or both. 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 Hit me up okay. with all those 2018 stats. All right, I have to load them up independently, but that's fine. So HTC China phase two, and HTC China phase one. Yep. Okay, and heroes. I'm looking for Alex Straza. So. Until you have those stats ready for us, I think I'm a little worried when I see the draft of A-Team. Now, they do have a couple of nice heroes tailored to the map, like that ETC or the Tyrael, most importantly. But with that Maiev as a last pick, are they going to have enough damage? I'm starting to get a little worried when it comes to that point. But they certainly have yeah. tons of CC. And if they use those well together, they can definitely make up for a lack of like raw innate damage. What was your prediction again? 53. Okay. Phase one, the win rate of Alex Straza was fifty-three percent. Are you kidding me? Phase two, it is forty. It is forty-one. Okay. All right. All but right. phase one, you nailed it. But it's Damn. slightly lower now, so it's probably about forty-nine-ish at this point. Yeah, forty-nine is. I guess it's okay. You know, the season hasn't really been played until the end, so maybe she's gonna make up a couple of percentage points uh, until it's done and over. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty much a pretty much a balanced hero, if you will. I'm seeing how many heroes have a 100% win rate. Quite a few. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I'll read off the heroes after this <laughs> game of the 100% win rate. I was just scrolling through because there's quite a few. As we load into game number one of this two-game series, between this team on the left, it is BTG with 619 on Diablo, LLK on Jaina, Druid on Alex Straza, Dancing on Phoenix, and three is playing the Dahaka. And their opponents in the Reds are going to be none other than the A-Team. You guys just saw them in the previous set. Now they're here again with Jaina on the ETC. Lele is playing that Hanzo. Then we have Maiv played by Bruiser. Stukov is on that Decker Kanek and Uncle G on that Tyrael. So if you guys paid attention like good boys and girls, then you will notice that Jaina no longer is an arranged assassin. He switched to the tank role again. That is something he has been doing consistently throughout the last phase. Uh, to pretty good success, I might want to say. So Jane on that ETC, no longer an arranged assassin. We're going to watch this player very, very carefully. I mean, this was the tank that he basically played yeah. consistently every single time here when he was the tank player for his team uh, previous season, right, uh, Sunny Lion, right before they got demoted. Mm -hmm. uh oh, there comes a gank attempt here onto Olele. I think the moment he heard that Deaka sound file, he immediately used the wall jump just to get out of harm's way immediately. All right, by the way, we see a pretty, pretty cool Maev build once again, one that we actually saw the other day as well already, Pursuit of Vengeance, which basically allows her to reduce the cooldown of Spirit of Vengeance whenever heroes are tethered. Um, so yeah, maximum ability, maximum disengage, as well as engaging power for the Maev of 18. As we see the mercenary camp being taken away here, dancing, doing uh, doing a pretty quick clear job with the help of his allies. Olele, just trying to get some scatter. He doesn't have any bonus damage to the mercenaries here as mm -hmm. of yet. We'll probably take that later on. Yeah. So, but in the meantime, still got some pretty quick clear speed. All right, so we can see how BTG prioritized the Bruiser camp rather than the Siege Giant camp, and I like that move because if you activate the Siege Giant camp a little later, then you're actually going to make sure that it's definitely going to cause some distraction and damage during the first tribute, right? With A-Team taking the Siege Giant camp early and not really supporting the push yet, I think it's probably going to get cleared very handsomely by BTG sooner or later. 
Now we see 619. Gets pulled in a little bit by Bruiser. Not enough to actually capitalize and make any kind mm -hmm. of play out of it. So it's all down to the A team now cleaning up this Bruiser camp. The Siege Island camp not taken by BTG yet. They're yeah. saving theirs. They were just trying to make some value out of grabbing their Bruiser camp first. Exactly. But now we have two heroes, the two assassins, in fact. We're going to take care of that. Alex Strasse is also helping them out, scouting the perimeter just to speed up things here a little bit. And three, that's the beauty of Dehaka. He basically licks a minion into tower range, which basically reduces the efficiency of this push by a large margin. And now the A-team, they're basically mirroring their opponent's moves. They're going for this Bruiser camp. Takes quite a while, though. And if you guys saw it, Hanzo was very low on mana as well. So he's going to have to pull back, retreat, and heal up. And look at that. Engage in invasion by Beyond the Game as well. The Dragon Queen might actually be used here to make them escape. Drew okay. is taken out by Bruiser okay. with a nice Bruiser sneaky can move. Take it. But Bruiser. Oh, Uncle G Dragon is trying out. to sneak it away. Three is trying to force Uncle G off the point. He might be able to drag him if LLK runs on. They teleport away. Oh. And the camp is stolen, but that was at the cost of ETC. Phoenix and Alex Raza. With, uh, with, however, Bruiser, he was able to escape. Yeah, that was a really nice invasion there by Beyond the Game. Not without any losses, not without any sacrifices themselves. But in the end, the result is what matters. And that is a mighty distraction of that Bruiser camp in the middle, allowing them to secure this first tribute immediately. Drop well done by Beyond the Game, but they're still a little bit behind in terms of, wait a minute, that ETC just got melted. Or should I say shattered by the ice magic of Jaina. Beautiful CC chain as well, allowing him to basically not run away or slide away with that power slide. So beyond the game, man, they're taking control into their hands, getting two towers in the top lane. Fantastic early game pressure. Okay, rotating with 619, Druid joining them as well. So far, XP a little bit even, but with those uh, with that mercenary steel, BTG have a slight lead in terms of experience. It's not significant, but it's slight. With the first tribute in their hands, are they going to be able to make us any kind of significant plays a little later on? For now, though, 619 is playing close to his base. Doesn't want to get himself yeah. caught out. Wants to clean up as that tower is dropping very low. Yeah, good defense so far. I'm not sure if A Team is willing to let go, though. The second tribute is actually going to spawn in a very close location to the first one, once again in the top half of the map. Now ETC is going to try and soak a little bit more, but already all the members of the A team are marching and crouching into the top location. Druid using the flames to scout. There goes Diablo. They caught him out. The abundance is healing him for now, though, and he's safe up to this point. Nice little play there D with Diablo surviving. It's going to allow Phoenix. Dancing to move in and look for the counter attack. Good power slide that might save Uncle Beautiful. G. He tries to be moved out, teleports into the back line. Look for Dancing here, who teleports away. Dancing at such low health, and that allows him to kill off Tyrael. Stukov now also low with no extra mobility of his own. He barely gets out with those potions. That was an MVP face melt by the ETC as well, blocking the pursuers off and the potions then sealing the deal. Are they actually willing to come back here? Stukov on the deck is so low still. I'm not sure if this is going to be a wise choice. Phoenix still in mighty good shape. Jaina, though, in that ETC, he's just not letting go. And here comes the real Jaina, played by LRK. Real Jaina on the way. As Bruiser comes to help against 619, they get the power slide. Jaina locking down 619 there on that Diablo. They're trying to grab him. This fight's confusing with all the Jaina. Yeah. As we see the pull in, Bruiser going on this one. Nice tackle there. Prevented the Spirit of Vengeance, although he's still able to teleport onto LLK and picks up the kill. Jaina, the hero, ends up falling yet again and dancing also on the retreat. I'm not sure if uh, Beyond the Game can continue to fight for this. And with that reckless move, with the tenacity to not let go, which oftentimes gets punished in HCC China, the A team secures themselves their first tribute as well. Uh-oh, Diablo scouted out. Did Stukov actually see the Diablo approaching? Beyond the, the game, Druid. hello? Druid getting taken out. This fight... Have we just been fighting since, like, minutes... Yeah. Minute four at this point? As a Lele sends in more scatter arrows. 619. Looks like they're finally retreating. This and is crazy. This fight is... This, okay, so we go from fighting for about three solid minutes into a boss attempt. Diablo's still nearby. They could try and go back in. <laughs> like this. But level 10's a little bit close. The A team will hit level yeah. 10 first. And as such, they should be able to secure this boss. I mean, it's cool. 
that you're trying to interrupt the boss, right? You're trying to contest it, but you need to make sure that your rotation is much more clean than this one. You can't actually just waltz into a unit of five members when you're only two or three and expect to get away with it. I mean, even the A team knows how to win those team fights. They show they've shown great team fighting in the previous series. They did exactly that over here as well. Now we have level 10 available for both teams. The stage dive, as we predicted, to come to the globals of Dehaka. You see the Warden's Cage, the Sanctification. So much AoE value available in one way or the other for the A-Team right now. They're going to look mighty scary. And look at Jaina. He's actually peeling for the boss, trying to keep the Dehaka at bay, trying to maybe deal with those Siege Giants eventually as well. So we see the boss will probably get the... For the sea, even with the sea giants clearing, they are too distracted by minions. Boss gets the fort. As we see everyone else fighting over top, the anti-healing onto Diablo. Anti -healing. Is a huge it actually prevented Druid there, who still gets the Dragon Queen out, wow. but it's a sleepy dragon as Druid still gets the Cleansing Flame out. Dalsing teleporting into the back line as the Cleansing Flame coming through. The isolation onto Deccan also preventing healing from the other side as Jada is completely separated from the team, goes down. Salvo! No way. Just enough to pull, but Dancing goes down. It was not enough to kill anyone. Yeah, but they're still looking mighty healthy because of the Dragon Queen and the healing she provides on all of her allied members. Dehaka is here as well, grabs him with the tongue. Tyrael, that is, he doesn't have the sanctification anymore. He only has the Eldrin's Might Blink. You can see the Life Blossom here. As long as Alexstrasza, as long as Druid picks that one up, he's going to cast heals for days and, most importantly, for free. So that last second escape there by Alexstrasza, Tetcher, I really think that made all the difference in that team fight. We're going to take another look at that here. Look at her actually pull off the Dragon Queen before the stage dive hits. And then in the Dragon Queen, you have a shorter activation window for Cleansing Flame. And that's actually what kept her alive. Otherwise, in human form or in Elven form, she would have died 100%. We see 619 getting some big hits onto so many members. But like you said, the Druid surviving there, able to make some turnaround Huge. plays, was pretty good. But it's not enough. Right now, Trivia Count 2 to 1 in favor of BTG. But the A-Team still holds the slightest of XP leads. Crazy game already from the start. And it, this is not the way I expected it to go. Olele, though, in trouble. Gets surrounded and sandwiched. And Stukov also needs to be on the lookout now with the Decker Kane. They actually turn around the Lightning Breath, but too little, too late. The Jaina actually ends up falling for BTG yet again. And that is not ideal. She is one of the main damage outputs here. Phoenix does get a nice uh, salvo, though. With uh, Hanzo and Deckard already down, they were able to make some plays yeah. there. That's do these teams just not know what laning is as they just continue <laughs> to brawl in the bot lane right now, focusing down Jada? These are so Synergy many resets. A whole chunk of damage. The resets on Bruiser, like you say, comes in. Looks like he wants to dive, but the Burrow 3 able to keep yeah. himself safe. Bruiser just blinks back to his original point. Eventually, I think Beyond the Game is going to back off, but look how aggressively the A team fought in this numbers disadvantage with Bruiser on that Mayev getting reset after reset, and they better get into good shape here for this next tribute. There's just team fighting nonstop on one of the more, I would say, macro oriented maps. It's just China, man. They just don't let go. They see enemy, they go face, they do not back down. Which is pretty cool, Uncle G. Tanking through at the moment. Trina Channel gives up to turn around and join his team in this little fight. Nice holy ground actually blocks away the Dragon Queen. With the sleep coming out, the sanctification for the great fight expires and is immediately met by fire and a lot of purification salvo shots as Dancing got a really good angle there with Maiev and Hanzo both biting the dust. And look at that. They're actually delaying this tribute pickup because they know they can actually get that boss for free now. And once again, the power of the Dragon Queen goes to show how impactful it can be. We're going to take another look at that. A great sanctification actually by Turiel, preventing a lot of the damage and the CC done here. The Ring of Frost, largely unimpactful because it only hit the ETC. It only hit the ETC indeed, whereas the Salvo oh hit God. everybody. Beautiful positioning by Dancing. Just yeah. so good in this particular fight. And they grab the boss, they grab the curse. They have got maximum value out of this now. The question is, how far are they going to go with it? Dancing, doing a little bit of a crap dance there on that Phoenix right under the enemy team's noses. Uh, feels good when you can go that deep and that close without getting punished. But that was basically because the A-Team was already in full retreat, right? So there was no health, no cooldowns left to actually burn on that Phoenix and punish him for that reckless engagement. So uh, that felt very rewarding. And with just one team fight beyond the game, 
takes so much momentum and they take so much of a lead. They're trying to actually not reinforce this push. I think they want to open up the map a little bit more by going for the middle. Definitely not a bad call per se. They're definitely going to extend that XP gap even more by doing this. Yes, they are. This is going to be a oh, triple laser. fort play as a three takes that down without too many difficulties. Dana needs to be careful where he stands, actually. Did you see that? Uh, the laser of dancing on the Phoenix, he actually hit every single building while standing right in the middle. The keep, the fountain, and the two towers. How, how close was it to Phoenix's body? How, how efficiently did he make it? I think it was max range, or close to max uh, range. Okay. Fair enough, because obviously, the, uh, for those who do not know, the closer you put Phoenix's uh, Plasma Caster to his body, the more value it actually is, because it has a set number of outer rotations, not center rotations. So you actually hit an enemy who is standing right next to you if you put your Plasma Caster next to you more times hmm. if you put your laser right next to you. I learn. There we go. Ah, learn. Knowledge brought to you by Daddy Techie. I like it. So it's not less knowledge, more science. A smaller more wheel science. will spin for uh, the center of a wheel. Sp uh, it, it, it's it's like gears, basically. It's gearing up. Where if you use a smaller wheel to turn a larger wheel, it's going to get more value than if you use a larger wheel to turn a smaller wheel because it has further to go. All right. In the meantime, we see yet another aggressive boss engage here by Beyond the Game. They do have the 16 advantage, though, of course. Diablo zoning out like an absolute champ. Turiel, though, he does have the Holy Ground. Uncle G could make that MVP play, but he's getting focused before he could even Looking get close correct. to the boss. The stun slam doesn't land, and ETC is joining the fray yeah. now as well. The cleansing flame comes down from above, healing the backline members who are just 2v1 in Jada. Salvo on just two members, denied. Beautiful Big. sanctification. Here comes the sleep. And this might be the moment of the 18. They pull forward looking for dancing, but he blinks away. Bruiser can't get his angle. Jada is separated. He will go down to the Arsenal Synergy here. Oh, hang on. The dies the vision. Oh. Face melt. There we go. Gets him anyway. And with ETC down, it's a one for one. With the hacker going down as well. Stokov is separated, and that oh. makes it a two for one. Uncle G will escape, but what could have been? Will he oh, though? Never mind. He will not escape in the slightest here. Dancing <laughs> surprise moves in from the side and picks up another Ooh. kill. Oh never my mind. goodness! Are you serious? The short invincibility window there from the Eldrins might kept Elturiel alive. That was the clutchest of escapes he could have hoped for. And uh, with that being said, without another maximum death timer, I don't think they can even hope to go for that boss call. Uh, also, of course, the tribute is very, very close. So they're probably going to get this without breaking much of a sweat there. But great escape by the Turiel. It was so close for Phoenix to find yet another target. So close. That was so close. If that had been a little bit so a little bit later, then he would have been shot by that Phoenix and exploded. If it was earlier, I'm not sure if the ability would have tracked him or not. Yeah, that's actually a good point. I'm not sure if he hit the sweet spot there or um, if he could have actually yeah. fall fallen there as well. Interesting. We would probably have to do a Phoenix. little bit of uh, um, like try mode and probably try yeah. those. Do Phoenix's at auto attacks track like say a, uh, a Mafurians or a Tyrandas, yep. or do they go to the original point if a target disappears? Hmm. Maybe it also had something to do with the fact that it's a splash attack, and maybe these splash attacks have a little bit of a different, um, yeah, you know, different behavior. Coding? I don't know. Possibly. I have to keep an eye. I'm just gonna yeah. uh, keep an eye on like whoever gets tackled by Diablo if there's a phase bomb. I think it's similar to uh, Zero Tool a Blink, though. Zero Tool also has the possibility to basically dodge auto attacks, so it's probably that's a very true. similar behavior. But once again, that's exactly the same frame perfect uh, mm, exactly. thing where you need to actually get the teleport frame itself. So the point there is, is it possible if he was to teleport earlier, after the attack's already locked on, but before it's about to hit yeah. him, for him to dodge it by for, uh, just straight up teleporting away, or will the attack follow him? It's basically that, that small window that you know from those fancy YouTube collection videos where you dodge a pyroblast, right? With that blink or with that teleport. Yeah. Um, it's basically a millisecond there that you have to hit the sweet spot, but Uncle G making it happen and look easy. For now, though, we're about to witness another team fight, and how does A team do it? They always stay close to their opponents in terms of XP, despite losing so many team fights already. But they themselves actually managed to get eight kills compared to the ten of Beyond the Game, so it's not like they didn't really get anything out of those team fights. Now, 619, yeah. he's still lurking around, he's still sneaking around, he's refusing to let go just like that. They're only half a level behind. 
Mm -hmm. DTC in the meantime is soaking bot against the hacker. He could stage dive in at any moment. Their team, they would love to. I mean, in theory, they could just sank down. Classic stalemate they right there. Really were desperate. Yeah, this is a stalemate. None of the teams actually has a major advantage. Both teams have one tank each to scout the perimeter and yeah. deny access, right? And both teams have one global. They delay once nice more. Huh. That's one I'm prevented from mounting via toasty sword, as I like to call it. As <laughs> yeah. I'll be able to step. Oh, oh, hang on. Holy ground comes in. Tackle onto Maev. Dahaka is going to come in from behind. It's the sanctification being held as the sleep comes in. Stage dive it from behind. Gets dancing here as Bruiser drops good damage. Ring of Frost only gets one oh. member, but that member is deleted. Hanzo removed from the fight. Sanctification is back off cooldown. It is dropped here and will block the salvo, but the health bars yep. on Deckard and Tyrael are so low. That interrupt on the first sanctification was huge. It was absolutely amazing. And uh, you mentioned it there. The sanctification there at the end didn't look too shabby under normal circumstances, but when all of your team members, all of your remaining team members, I should say, are already brought down to 30, 20% health, Wait, are they actually going to try to end this? They're not going for the boss. They're not going for a merc camp. They're going for the keep through the little wall gap. And I think they're going to try to do it. I think it. I might be wrong. I think I might be wrong. Their race potential is really slow. They're, they're going to try. They've Phoenix, got Phoenix, Jaina, though? Uh, it's going to be close. Oh, it's going to be very close, actually. No, they should get this. Okay. Kill core health's always low, significantly lower than I keep thinking it is. Here comes Hanzo, but there's very little he can do. He doesn't even have Dragon Arrow yet. Yeah. It's going to be all down to some refined. Oh, oh, oh. It's not even close, and that is going to be it. Game number one goes over to BTG. Immediately smelling their chance to end this game right there and going straight for the core, not wasting any time.